This is Barry Zalma. I'm an attorney who has retired from the practice of law and spend my time now acting as an insurance claims expert witness, an insurance claims consultant, an author of insurance books, and these videos. Today I want to talk about an interesting case from the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals where they determined that a policy obtained by fraud requires the insured to reimburse the insurer for the money spent in providing defense and indemnity to the insured, and that a threat of a bad faith suit adds, in fact, to the insurer's claims of uh, fraud. The case is called Evanston Insurance Company versus Amino Kit Laboratories and dealt with a case where an insurer asserted claims against its insured for fraud and unjust enrichment. The Tenth Circuit was asked to determine if Colorado law permitted an insurer to recover a settlement payment made on behalf of its insured for fraud. The insured fraudulently obtained an insurance policy for its inpatient drug treatment center, and when the insured was sued by a former patient, the insurer assumed the insured's defense subject to a reservation of rights. Even after learning that the insured had fraudulently obtained the policy, the insurer settled with the former patient under pressure from the insured and threats of a bad faith lawsuit. The insurer sued in federal court and sought to recover the settlement payment and its defense cost payments from the insured. Now, the background of the case started with Amino Kit Laboratories, a Colorado corporation, owned and operated an addiction treatment center in Lone Tree, Colorado. On October 19, 2014, AminoKit procured an insurance policy for the treatment center from Evanston Insurance Company. The policy covered outpatient drug and alcohol rehab services, and to secure the policy, AminoKit made several material misrepresentations and omissions. For example, AminoKit failed to disclose that it maintained overnight beds for its patients instead of claiming that it operated its business solely between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. AminoKit also falsely denied that any of its employees had been evaluated or treated for alcoholism or drug addiction, and even misrepresented the circumstances by which its CEO had lost her chiropractic license. These are the kinds of things that no liability insurer would reasonably decide to issue a policy with such information. Eventually, a person by the name of Brandon Lastly, a former AminoKit patient, sued AminoKit, Dr. Jonathan Lee, AminoKit's medical director, and Tamia Ray Sisko, AminoKit's CEO, in the District of Colorado. Evanston initially refused to provide a defense, concluding that the claims were outside the scope of coverage because they only alleged intentional and fraudulent conduct. Leslie Realizing that there's no insurance company deep pocket, amended his complaint, adding state claims against AminoKit and Dr. Lee for negligence and breach of fiduciary duty. Evanston again concluded there was no coverage for the lastly suit, but because of the amendment, it accepted AminoKit's defense subject to a full reservation of rights, including the right to withdraw the defense and the right to pursue reimbursement from AminoKit while it sought a declaration of its rights and duties under the policy by a separate suit for declaratory relief. At a mediation, 
forced by a court. Amino Kit's attorney, Jared West, pressured Eviston to pay the full $260,000 settlement amount agreed to by the mediator and the parties by threatening to bring a bad faith claim against Evanston. In the communications that follows, Evanston made clear to West that if it settled the case, it would seek reimbursement for the entire cost of defense and indemnity. Faced with the deadline and threat of bad faith litigation, Evanston agreed to fund the $260,000 settlement while reserving the right to seek full reimbursement from AminoKit. In a declaratory relief action filed originally before the payment, Evanston sought a declaration that it owed nothing to AminoKit and was entitled to a refund of all of the damages paid and all attorney's fees incurred on behalf of AminoKit. The final claims alleged that AminoKit had made fraudulent misrepresentations and concealments in AminoKit's insurance policy application and sought damages for the fraud, including the settlement payment and the defense costs. AminoKit's lawyers, apparently not pleased with their client, withdrew, and AminoKit failed to gain new counsel. In due course, a default judgment resulted against AminoKit, and the district court entered judgment that held it liable to reimburse Evanston for the settlement payment as damages for both fraud and unjust enrichment for $427,280.30, including $77,568 in prejudgment interest. Now, for a court to order this kind of damages, uh, faced with a challenge by the defendant uh, who is challenging a default judgment, that defendant admits to the complaint's well-pleaded facts and forfeits his or her ability to contest those facts. But even in a default, the defendant is not prohibited from challenging the legal sufficiency of the judgment. Under Colorado law, the defrauded party may recover such damages as are a natural and proximate consequence of the fraud. The damages must stem from the plaintiff's reliance on the fraud. To claim damages from allegedly fraudulent statements, the plaintiff the insurance company must establish detrimental reliance on the statements. Evidence established that Evanston would not have issued the policy had AminoKit disclosed or communicated the true facts of its operation. AminoKit argued that because Evanston knew of the fraud when it settled, it could not have relied on the fraud when it agreed to fund the settlement. Generally, a defrauded party cannot recover damages for the period after the victim discovers the fraud because he no longer has any basis for relying on the misrepresentation. But where the defrauded party discovers the fraud after substantial performance or where it would be economically unreasonable to terminate the relationship, that party can affirm or continue the contract and then bring suit for his entire damages. The Tenth Circuit concluded that it would have been economically unreasonable for Evanston to refuse to pay the settlement because doing so would have placed Evanston at risk of a bad faith lawsuit. The court recognized that an insurer owes its insured a duty of good faith and fair dealing. Violation of this duty can result in a bad faith claim against the insurer judged by a reasonableness standard. In this case, Evanston was rightfully concerned about a potential bad faith suit by AminoKit given the threats made by its attorney after Evanston originally balked at paying the settlement. 
After learning of the fraud, Evanston was in no position to abandon its defense without risking substantial liability or at least incurring substantial litigation costs from defending a bad faith suit. Given these considerations, the Tenth Circuit concluded the settlement payment was a natural and proximate consequence of Amino Kit's fraud. The court noted that Colorado has adopted a general policy against insurance fraud. This is something that's been adopted by almost every state in the, U in the Union and are usually called the Insurance Fraud Protection Acts, allowing insureds to receive the benefit of insurance coverage, even when they have fraudulently obtained it, would foster not deter insurance fraud, as is the public policy of the state. It would signal to potential fraudsters that if they can convince the insurance company to settle via the threat of bad faith litigation, they will benefit from their fraud. Such a result would not comport with Colorado public policy, nor, for that matter, the public policy of any state in the United States. And therefore, the Tenth Circuit concluded that Evanston can recover the settlement payment made on behalf of Omino Kid as fraud damages. Now, in my opinion, insurance fraud perpetrators should never be allowed to profit from their fraud. Since the policy was subject to rescission or voidance as a result of a blatant and admitted fraud, the insured had no right to defense or indemnity only a potential, which Evanston protected. However, since the fraud was not detected until after the insurer agreed to defend, subject to a reservation of rights, it had no good way to escape the obligation without facing a bad faith lawsuit seeking both contract and tort damages and the concomitant high cost of defending a bad faith suit. The insured's threat and the threat made by its lawyer forced the insurer to fund the settlement and seek reimbursement. The Tenth Circuit agreed, enforced the right to reimbursement, and hopefully the defendants will have sufficient funds to pay the judgment. If not, even with the judgment, the fraud succeeded. You can read about this and other cases dealing with insurance fraud at my twice-monthly publication of the Zalma Insurance Fraud Letter. You can find it, including the last two issues, at my website at www.zalma.com and just click on the link for Zalma's Insurance Fraud Letter. Subscriptions to the Fraud Letter, like subscriptions to this YouTube channel, are free. Thank you for your attention.